This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us here on Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. It's another Friday afternoon, and we're glad you're with us. Uh, Likeable Science is all about how science is in all of our lives, a vital part of all of our lives, interesting, uh, current, and uh, relevant to everyone. So we shouldn't be scared of it, we shouldn't try to relegate it to the ivory tower, we, we should embrace it and enjoy it. Today, to help me explore that is uh, Susan Scott. Welcome, Susan. Thank you. Good to have you back here. Nice to be back. Susan is a naturalist, biologist, author, speaker, <laughs> all, all kinds of things, and she has a new book out called The Colea. Uh, a beautiful, beautiful book. Actually, it's truly, a, it, it is a stunning, beautiful book, and, and you were just telling me it won an award? It won an award from the Hawaii Publishers Association for a Best Natural History Book for the last two years. Congratulations. We're really oh, proud of it and happy for our Kalea, and I'm the co-author of right, this. So. Right. Your, your, your other uh, author is currently in Montana, you the, say. Yeah, right. the, the, my co-author is in Montana, and he's the one who did all the research that got and all the pictures that got in there. Yeah, so be so. beautiful pictures, uh, all kinds of stuff. Great uh, things on the history of it, uh, of the stones they used to use to help right. catch them. Right. The Hawaiian, how the Hawaiians caught them. Right. Uh, amazing, uh, great information in this book, and so well presented. Well, thank you, thank you. Uh, Wally Johnson is the name of the mm -hmm. researcher, and he has been studying these birds most of his adult life and writing uh, research papers on them that were kind of hard to find and for the public to get to. And so uh, I started writing about the birds in my column. And this is the Ocean Watch. My column. Ocean Watch column. I write a weekly column for the Star Advertiser. Right. And someone sent years ago sent it to Wally in Bozeman, Montana, and he sent me some of his papers, mm -hmm. knowing that I was interested. Uh -huh. So we did that for some years, and then and then a couple of years ago said, you know, we need to get together on this and uh -huh. write a, a popular science book for the public, so they have a place to look up the birds, because people love their birds. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons they love the birds is because they are so adaptable to human beings. Right. And maybe on that so, note, we should show you, yeah, got, you gave us a pictures. series of pictures here. So if we could get yeah. the first one of those up. So, so first that's, one is obviously that's the, the book. book and, <coughs> that's a, and that's Wally. The great thing about the references in this book is the references are Johnson, 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 Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> Wally's the only one who's done research on these for years right. and published a lot of papers. And so the research was easy. <laughs> To, because I, they were all one person, right. so if I asked Wally and he didn't know, no one knows. <laughs> and so there were a few things, you know, we'd still like to know, and he is actually still doing some hmm. research. So the, the, the birds are really popular in Hawaii because they're so adaptable, and they have really taken advantage of our, our buildings, our golf courses, our you know, mowing the lawns, introducing alien insects, <laughs> and they... Uh, They've just taken taken over, so they're they're really quite tame. I, they're wild birds, but mm -hmm. but they become accustomed enough to people and come to the same place every year. Each individual has its own um, foraging area because that's its survival, that's mm -hmm. its um, food, and so. Every year, if you have a bird in your yard, you'll see that bird year after year, and they live up to 20 years. Mm -hmm. That that's really old for a bird. Mostly they're they're eight to ten, mm -hmm. uh, but but they have that they will do live up to 20. And so you get to know the birds, mm -hmm. and the birds get to know the people in the house. Mm -hmm. And so I get lots of stories, really fun stories from my column from people who say, "Oh, my bird! <laughs> I have one that said my bird." won't go out of the backyard unless I open the gate. <laughs> and these <laughs> birds can fly. <laughs> and so he said if he opens the gate, the bird will walk through the gate, and then he'll close it, and then it forages around the front yard, and then he it opens the, the gate, gate, and it goes in <laughs> the back. <laughs> I don't know if it's knocking. <laughs> and another reader said, my neighbor put out a broken television set on the curb for pickup, and his plover went out there and sat in front of the TV, seeing its reflection, oh. obviously, but looked like it was watching television. <laughs> and he said it was hilarious. All the neighbors were watching the bird get <laughs> like this in the TV. <laughs> so, so they're they're really charming birds, and they're very. Um, that, that picture I showed is was my plover uh, who comes up to the the 
Lanai and uh -huh. knows when the the screen was shut. Uh -huh. Now Lucy is a pretty old mellow dog, and she didn't uh -huh. ever lunge after it. But it knew if the screen was open, it didn't come up there. Uh -huh. And if the screen was shut, it would come up there, and then I would give it some scrambled eggs, uh -huh. which is right. what Wally says we can feed them. Uh, the birds that get to know us, if you can get the bird away from the minas and the other ones because they all like scrambled <laughs> sure, eggs. Sure, sure. Yeah. But um, it's protein and fat and that's that's really good food yeah. for them. Excellent. So so maybe we look at the next picture here and because this will help get people yeah. familiar with them in case you don't recognize them already. Another right? thing people have written to me is like I had this beautiful bird in my yard, this collet in my yard all winter and it looks like this and then um, come February, March, I had a different bird. <laughs> so this is the winter colors of these birds. They change colors. So the next picture, the, uh -huh. this is the spring colors. Uh -huh. And both of them, you can see, look quite different. All of them look like the former picture. The males turn in this beautiful black, black feathers on their uh, face and breast. And the females have uh, more of a model color, but it's still quite a change. And so the bird was the same bird mm -hmm. that the person had in their yard. But pe people didn't know that. Right, it, they don't you know, it was they can molt and the feathers are quite different. This is a br these are breeding colors, and so they're getting ready uh, in these at this time to go to Alaska. Mm -hmm. And that's where our birds go. Right, and it's amazing and these birds fly obviously nonstop, uh, right. from here to Alaska, yeah. right? And that's many thousands of miles. Yeah. They uh, leave around April 26th, 27th. The date's pretty fixed because they go by light, by uh -huh. the amount of light. And they fly 3,000 miles nonstop, right. these four ounce birds. By, by that, but in the spring, they're about seven ounces. But it's just an astonishing feat right. of, of nature to be able to fly over the Pacific Ocean. They don't stop. Right. They get up to 100 miles an hour in the jet stream. Yeah. I mean, you'd think their little feathers would just go <laughs> flying off them at 100 miles an hour. I don't know if we, how long yeah. we could stand it on. Yeah. But they're, they're uh, one of the reasons Wally wanted to make the subtitle of the book The Amazing Life mm -hmm. of the Pacific Golden Plovers is because they are amazing. Yeah, that, that, that's really, I mean, I, right. I was going to say, you know, you talked about how they live considerably yeah. longer than similar size birds. Right. This is the benefits of exercise. Right, right. <laughs> benefits of exercise, exactly. And then they go there because they're going to raise chicks. Right. And so uh, no one knows if they form pair bonds here in Hawaii. There's there's another population outside of Hawaii, but our book's mostly about the Kalea right. in Hawaii. That's because Kalea is a Hawaiian word. But there's another population in Asia. So anyway, the, um, the, the birds go, our Hawaii birds go to a, a certain area in Alaska that Wally has identified by, mm -hmm. by tracking the birds. And, and um, they mate, the, the male makes a lovely little nest on the ground, mm -hmm. and the female chooses whichever male and nest she likes. Mm -hmm. And they ha have four eggs, she lays four eggs, and they raise four chicks. The chicks are like, chickens and that when they're hatched they immediately start eating. As mm -hmm. soon as they're dry they're walking around eating and they're in Alaska because there's 24 hours of light right. so they can eat 24 hours and the insects are just swarming. Right. So, so I don't know if you've been there but uh, No, but but I was fairly I about this. Yeah, yeah. And it's 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 a uh, it seems like such a crazy idea that yeah. they would fly 3000 exactly. miles. But what they're flying to is this banquet which right. is the only way they can right. have enough food to so the chicks can the, eat. And they have to right. grow up really fast. Right. And so because, yeah, they, they can't delay their return no, either. No, no. And so so that's the reason. And they've you know, they've evolved to to fly those distances. There's other shorebirds right. that do the same thing. So yeah, yeah. it really makes you appreciate nature. When you yes. Uh, I mean lots lots mm -hmm. of birds migrate most of them much shorter than that, most of them over right. land, but, right. but these amazing sea, yeah. over sea migrations yeah. where you realize that there, there is no stopping. Right. You know, there's, right. no, there's no, let's, let's do this in two bounds instead the of one. Plover, the Pacific Golden Plovers that spend winters in Samoa, Tahiti, Palau, the South Pacific Islands, and I've seen them there and think, I can't believe you flew all of them down here. Because <laughs> it's even far right. for me to fly from here to Palau. Right, yeah. But um, they, they stop over in Japan. Right and eat insects in rice fields and other areas because they can't carry enough fat 
to make that long of a migration. Right. So, they do a so that's short, one stop. Yeah, a relatively short it's like, stop. It's like a rice field stop. Yeah, yeah. 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 So they'll stop and refuel. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then go on up. And to that's what Wally calls it too: is a refueling stop. Yeah. yeah. And so if they, if they if they carried enough fat to make the trip, they couldn't fly. Right. So. Yeah, no, it's, again, a beautiful right. example of a biological sort of mechanism. How do you balance off that? Exactly. Yeah, how yeah. much fat you can afford to carry. Yeah. Yeah. And, then in, and then the chicks do, uh, mature fairly fast. Um, I think they're flying in a, they have their wings developed in a month. I'm not sure they're actually flying. But in August, the females leave first, mm -hmm. exhausted from laying eggs. If they lose their four eggs, they can relay four more. Yeah, I was reading that in just yeah. a, a matter of like a, in a week. week. Yeah, and amazing. And the total weight of the four eggs is the same weight as the female. Right. So it's an enormous uh, energy expenditure. Right, right. And so it's not no wonder the females get back right. to Hawaii first. <laughs> right. it's like I'm going. Right. <laughs> and yeah, and then the males uh, stay with their chicks. They don't. They don't. Uh, stay right with them because they're out all foraging for themselves. But if it's cold, or predators are nearby, the males uh, and oh. the females both protect them. Oh. And so sit they, on they, them. they show some parental care and yeah, they yeah. show okay. parental care up until then when the males leave. So we see the females in for early August. Mm -hmm. And every year, people say, wow, they're back really early. Okay. They're always <laughs> back in early August. It's just that there aren't that many. We don't really, mm -hmm. not everyone sees them in August. Mm -hmm. And then the males come next, and this is in general. And mm -hmm. then the chicks stay as long as they can find food. Right. And it's not st snowing. Right. I mean, when, once the weather changes and the insects are gone, right. they eat berries. Uh -huh. So they can still eat berries, but they get as much weight on them as they can before they yeah. take off. And again, you think about the interesting biological pressures. You have to be a very good at sort of sensing just just how right. long can you stay here right. eating? Exactly. Because you don't want to be caught by the, the first snow. Yeah. Or you're going to be losing heat, right. losing weight. Well, the bad news yeah. is right. only about 20 percent of the chicks survive their first year in uh -huh. Hawaii. Uh, so they've got to get here on their own. Mm -hmm. They don't have any adult guidance. Right. That's just an instinct. And then once they get here, they've got to find their own territory. Mm -hmm. And birds that already have staked out their territory will fight. Mm -hmm. And the, and these birds are really skinny. There's a picture in there of a new right. first-year bird that just looks emaciated. So. Uh, the good news is the 20% that make it through their first year live long lives. Yeah, yeah. So I see empty spaces sometimes, <laughs> you know, in my travels and my life, and I think this would be a perfect <laughs> spot for a yeah, kalea. You could come over here. Because right, they don't really need that much space, no, right? I mean, no. Because of, no. as long as there's a diversity of right. insects. And, all. and I live near Kailua Beach Park, and there's there's four in. Right next, not right next to each other, but you can kind of see where the edges of their territories uh -huh. are, and they're always the same ones. Huh. And I know that because we tried to rescue one's got a broken leg. Uh -huh. I think I have a picture of the one with the broken leg. One, uh, another reader called me and said, "There's a Kalea who's just returned. This was in uh, September, or no, it was actually in um, still in August. She's re returned and her leg's broken." So we, I went over and took this picture, and we decided, um, my husband's a doctor, and said it's dislocated. That, that's the ankle. Mm -hmm. They have really long ankle right. bones. Uh, it seems dislocated, and if we could catch it, we might be able to pop it back, because you can do that in people. Right. So we went to, uh, the bird was actually looking not bad, mm -hmm. and she's hopping around. And Wally said they live fine with one leg. Mm -hmm. If we could have to even remove it, that would mm -hmm. be okay. So the next picture was, um, I called uh, one of Wally's former colleagues who's here in Hawaii, mm -hmm. and this is called a net gun. And these birds are very wary, but if you just walk by and you act like you're not really paying attention, you, you, can, you know you get, get pretty close. Right. And so Josh brought over the, the net gun, mm -hmm. and we um, tried to act very casual. Mm -hmm. Next picture. And that, that's the net. So mm -hmm. when you fire the gun, it's a CO2 cartridge. Mm -hmm. It throws the net out. It's got little weights on those corners. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, doesn't hurt the bird, but mm -hmm. catch, catches it. So next picture. We try. <laughs> Josh shot once, and he's done quite a few. Mm -hmm. But he overshot because normally the birds 
when the pop goes, it's a loud bang. Goes fo the bird flies forward and and storm. We named this one Storm, mm -hmm. flew sideways. Uh -huh. And so the net went over it. Mm -hmm. And that bird really, we were there for a couple, a good couple <laughs> hours afterwards, just saying, oh, we're not <laughs> trying to catch you. Yeah, and I said, you know what? Yeah. And so this is Josh, and that's Storm. And she was watching everything he sure. did. And so he said, I, I can see her looking at me. There's no way I'm going to get mm -hmm. close. As mm -hmm. soon as he would try to, he's loaded the gun again. Mm -hmm. As soon as he got around, she would take off. Yeah. And we didn't want to want her sure. to make her fly because she's already damaged. So um, I was there. Uh, next picture. This is yesterday. Okay. Huh. Uh, I, I sent you this picture okay. earlier, right. but, but I was there yesterday and got an identical picture okay. and she still yeah. got yeah. the yeah. leg. But she's fat. Yeah. Yeah. So while we think she'll do better if we can catch her, so we might try again, okay. but they're brilliant. So. And we're going to continue this conversation, but I've been told we need to take a short oh, break here. Okay. And uh, Susan Scott is here with me here on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, and we'll be back in just a minute. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Aloha, I'm Carol Mon Lee, Think Tech Hawaii's Volunteer Chief Operating Officer and occasional host, and this is Minky. For the first time, ThinkTech Hawaii is participating in an online, web-based fundraising campaign to raise $40,000. Give thanks to ThinkTech will run only during the month of November, and you can help. Please donate what you can so ThinkTech Hawaii can continue to raise public awareness and promote civic engagement through free programming. I've already made my donation and look forward to yours. Please send in your tax-deductible contribution by going to this website www.thanksforthinktech.cosvox.com. On behalf of the community enriched by ThinkTech Hawaii's 30 plus weekly shows, thank you, mahalo, and shishe for your generosity. And you're back here on Lakeable Science here on ThinkTech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today in ThinkTech Studios is Susan Scott naturalist, biologist, author, and we are talking about her new book, uh, The Kolea, uh, The Hawaiian Golden Plover. And we were going, she was actually just telling us uh, this amazing bird locally here, I guess over in, you say, Kalea, uh, hey. Ka oh, the, the uh, Beach Park. Kailua Beach Park, Ka right, Kailua Beach Storm. Park. Right, right. Uh, with, with a, apparently a dislocated leg, right. and uh, they're try, trying to catch it so you can help it. Uh, right. Although it sounds like it doesn't need that much help if it's able to avoid you. So, right. so well, you don't want to hurt it right. in, the, in the process of helping it. Right. But um, I think if we, we, we might try again. Yeah. I don't think she can migrate with that. Like it kind of stands out uh -huh. sideways. Huh. So. So uh, interesting. So okay. Um, and let's see. Was this the end of our pictures or? Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, so these birds, uh, they they do this migration. To Alaska uh, in the spring, in the spring, spring, basically April, end of April, and then come back here in August, basically. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, while they're here, they're basically go out of breeding condition and are just sort of relaxing and enjoying Hawaii, right? Right, <laughs> right exactly. And and bulking up from those three thousand mile flights because right. they do that twice a year. Right. Yeah. And get, so getting ready for the next. The one. The whole job is to get fat. Right. For the migration both ways. Yeah, and it's intriguing. They're, yeah. they're, I mean, their life, it sounds like, revolves around this whole, whole sort of eating binge, right? right? They're here right. eating to fuel up their journeys. Right. And they're there so that their chicks can yeah. get enough food because their chicks couldn't survive on the small plots they have no. here, basically, no. right? But the good news is we have enough, we have imported a lot of uh, alien insects and spiders and mm -hmm. things that they can eat and so that's good for us they eat a lot of those things that, right that right so these are these right. these birds are good to have around yeah and we've we've opened up a lot of space by mowing the lawns mm -hmm. they like the flat snow, right short. there are some pictures in here of, of right. uh, their preferred kind of habitat which is very much sort of more or less our preferred habitat punchbowl cemetery right. is a great place for yeah. them yeah so there must be in yeah goodly numbers of them there yes yeah. i think i think well i said there's about 100 oh. and 100 acres oh. And speaking of these birds, oh, you, you were just telling me when you came in about an amazing one that you just read. Well, yeah, through. I got an email yesterday that said uh, from a reader who I don't know yet, but I probably will. He said, I found a leucistic 
Plover. No, leucistic. And leucistic, <laughs> I looked up. I, I knew it had something to do with white, right. <laughs> but uh, it's not albino, but it's it's got a, a melanin disorder that makes it mostly white. Mm -hmm. So this one has all white feathers. It's got a few dark spots on its back, but its eyes are dark, so it probably does not have the vision problems that albinos have. Mm -hmm. And um, so I sent that to Wally, who's our worldwide uh, plover expert, mm -hmm. and he said, oh, I, I've never heard of one. Mm -hmm. It's really ex exciting. Mm -hmm. So I drove out there this morning with my new camera, mm -hmm. and uh, the reader is his name is uh, Bill Koch, C O K E. Mm -hmm. He said um, it was right near the entrance where you drive in. Mm -hmm. Well, these birds are so That's so territorial. They're right? so they're so accommodating to us. They were there. Mm -hmm. He was the, the she was there. I named her Blanche just uh -huh. so we don't say the bird of the the <laughs> leucistic bird, right. which no no one else will know. But uh, Blanche was right on the curb, right on the edge mm -hmm. there, and I got out of my car and she let me take a bunch of pictures. Excellent. She's mostly all white mm -hmm. feathers with just a few dark spots on her back and seems to be really healthy. So. Interesting, because that, that, again, as with the albinos, is somewhat of a disadvantage in the wild, right? right. I mean, they, they become an obvious target, yes. basically. Yes. Uh -huh. And the big tar the big predators are cats, feral cats. And mm -hmm. so at Heia Boat Harbor, next door is Heia State Park, mm -hmm. and people feed cats there. Mm -hmm. I counted 35 in the parking lot. Oh. Uh, about a year ago when I was there, and I'm looking for a picture for a white turn book I'm writing mm -hmm. of a feral cat, and I thought, well, I'm in feral cat <laughs> heaven here. So I pulled in there, there were 15, mm -hmm. just all lying around, and um, that's her gonna be her biggest problem, because it's oh. really close, and yeah. cats. And that's, you know, they, they seem pretty tame, and pe there are four food dishes out, mm -hmm. so people are clearly feeding them, so. Maybe she'll be okay, but plovers are really alert to predators, yeah. super alert. So Wally said, I've not been to Alaska with him when he's doing his his tag, GPS ta mm -hmm. tagging, but um, he can't get anywhere near the same birds that you can walk pretty much up to here. Yeah, it's very intriguing. Again, it's yeah. just the bird's intelligence. They have, they have right. a sense of a sort of context. They know that right. when they're here, People right. moving near them are of no concern, right. but in Alaska... And there, when they have chicks, right. anything moving is right. a predator, and they're very, right. very wary. And they have a bunch of strategies to, uh, I mean, they, they one, they can freeze yeah. and blend in quite right. well, yeah. but they can also, they'll do a, a broken wing kind broken of strategy. Wing. They pretend their wing's broken, broken and, and leave go the limping away. away, yeah, right. yeah. And then manage to recover nicely. <laughs> That's right, and then recover. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and they can, I, I mean, I guess they can put up a good struggle, too, uh, you know, when push comes to shove, right? If they get, right. yeah. And, there, yeah, there's a picture of them uh, fighting here in mm -hmm. Hawaii over territory. And I had a, re a couple of readers have emailed me that their plover can beat up a mina. Uh -huh. Their plover wins mm -hmm. when they're fighting with a mina over, over food, food or sticks. Yeah, right. And the, the food thing, a lot of people say don't feel wild, wild birds, and almost mm -hmm. everybody does. Mm -hmm. It's just one of those things. Sure. It's our touch with wildlife. It's, mm -hmm. our, it's, it's the thing that we, as humans, need, I think, to, mm -hmm. to see wildlife and Absolutely. to be uh, connected. connected, exactly. Yeah. And so uh, Wally said if you, if, if you do decide to feed your bird, mm -hmm. uh, because it does feel like your bird, too, mm -hmm. there's just one, to give them healthy food. Mm -hmm. And mealworms are another thing besides the scrambled eggs. But mm -hmm. he has a picture of a guy who tamed his bird well enough to land on his hand and eat mealworms mm -hmm. out of his hand. And the bird lived, I think, 17, maybe mm -hmm. 15 years. Mm -hmm. And so clearly it did fine by be, by feeding it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, uh, just want to be careful not to feed it with their cats around right. or mongooses. Yeah, I want to want to be sure that it. Although I can't imagine any of those animals getting predators getting close mm -hmm. to these birds because they're so wary of something like that. You know, yeah. a, a small animal like that would just totally scare them away. Right. Interesting that they can again they make that distinction and, yeah. and understand that people are no real threat to them here. Right. Exactly. That's a, that's a very it's a con yeah. contextually dependent but also discriminating. Right. Right. Uh, the so. one thing they haven't learned is uh, about barn owls. Uh -huh. So they sleep on flat roofs mm -hmm. and at night they're up high, they're usually fine, but we have imported, the state of Hawaii imported barn owls to control rodents. No, I, didn't, I didn't know that until I read that in this yeah. book actually. 
in the 1950s, yeah. and there's a lot of barn owls uh, in Hawaii, and they are nocturnal predators. All right. So they just pick them off. Mm -hmm. I've seen dead plovers out at Flat Island off Kailua Beach mm -hmm. Park, probably from the owls. Mm -hmm. But they should uh, presumably continue to do reasonably well with this further development in some senses, just giving them more territory, right? Right, um, right. Uh, as, as we yeah. clear off what were agricultural fields that are not so useful to them, basically. Exactly. And turn them into suburban right. yards. That, that works become, for them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they, Unlike most wildlife, right, right. it works for birds, <clears throat> yeah, uh, yeah. these birds in particular. But yeah, I, uh, there's no official count, but I think Wally believes that they're doing just fine. Yeah. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah. That's uh, they they are truly uh, amazing creatures, uh, it's, and it's so wonderful to have this this absolutely gorgeous uh, guide to them. That so it, it's thorough, it's it's authoritative, it's it's accessible, which is <laughs> which is you know I, I, as you were saying earlier, that's what you want to when you're doing a popular science book. You can't you don't want to stick in a lot of scientific names. You don't want to stick in a lot of jargon, a lot of technical information. But you've got nice, it's got beautiful diagrams and pictures. Uh, very uh, easy to understand, but but a great deal of information. Well, thank it's, you. it's truly a, a, a beautiful book. Um, where are you off to next? You, because you're just uh, back, right? Yeah, I'm just back from Australia, uh, yeah. where uh, Craig and I have our sailboat mm -hmm. in Townsville, mm -hmm. and we had some great times on the Great Barrier Reef. Yeah, I read really about nice. them in your Ocean Watch column. And I'm off to Midway, ah. and Craig's going to go with me. We are going to be counting albatrosses oh, at huh. Midway Atoll, oh, how and then exciting. after that, Palau. Palau. Oh, yeah, I've what, got a busy, busy yeah, what, winter. What are you doing in Palau? I'm, I'm leading a, I'm the naturalist on a snorkeling trip for Oceanic Society. Oh, okay, okay. So I, it's a job. I, yeah, yeah. I know life's tough. <laughs> it's a job. And after that, this is a busy year for us. Uh, we're going to Bangladesh to uh, work in a clinic. Craig and I started oh. in 1997. That's still going Excellent. and doing well. We had to skip last year. There was some violence there, yeah. but it seems to have been stopped and. The uh, State Department thinks it's safe again. So, excellent. Well, Susan, it, it was great having you on the show here again. Thank and you. Uh, Thank you. Susan Scott, uh, co-author uh, with Wally Johnson of uh, Hawaii's Kolea, a, a wonderful book. I highly encourage everyone to read it. Thank you. Very nice to have you here. Aloha. Thanks for inviting me again. And join us next week for another episode of Likeable Science. <laughs>